little sweet baby girl, Ellis Joy, has decorated my notebook. <laughs> so I, too, have baby's breath. I am going to take that out because <laughs> I can't turn the page. Oh, my word. Okay. There we go. Right there. I love it. I love it. Welcome back. We have round tables. So you're like, you know, already in small groups. And I kind of like this. I can't guarantee that it'll be like that next week. They had a meeting right before. So, um, but so I, I like I like that y'all can look at each other and be like, this is, I like this. It makes me happy. Um, okay, real quick, because we've got some new faces, and I kind of want to do like a little quick review. It's the homeschooler in me. I've got to do a review. And when I say review, I'm not going to make you like raise your hand, but I just kind of wanted to just, you know, kind of hit some bullet points of things that we have discussed in the past three weeks or two weeks that you've either studied or that we have shared. And the first thing that, that we talked about was that everything that God does is based on covenant, um, literally from beginning to end. And everything that he does is based on he's a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. Everything that he does, everything that he does is based on covenant. So that's why we're studying it. We want to get to know our God. Um, another thing that we've learned is covenant. When you hear covenant, you think blood. Covenant's messy. It's bloody. Um, and by that, that image should be coming to you from Genesis 15 with Abraham, or Abram at the time. Uh, the passing through the pieces of flesh that he cut or sacrificed and separated to make an aisle. Uh, but covenant is a, is a bloody image. Um, there's a, there's a, that concept is associated with it. And that God is the one who kept the covenant, especially with Abraham, that specific one. He kept the covenant himself. And when the, the practice of covenant that we um, talked about from week one and just that we've kind of been highlighting along the way is the, when, they would, when people, either man, man, man and women, man and women, Lord help me. Y'all, I'm tired. I drove in from Alabama. So just give me grace if y'all don't mind. I need it. Pray for me because it's going to come out tonight. So, um, but the, the, when people entered into a covenant relationship, they would do that, the custom of passing through the, the path of blood. Uh, the first one would go and then the second person would go, symbolizing if I don't keep my covenant, if I don't keep my word, may you do this to me. The, the symbol of the animals being, uh, you know, dead. I mean, that's a pretty graphic and harsh consequence to not keeping the covenant, but that's, that's something just to note. Um, and the, a covenant creates a relationship. When you enter into a covenant, it is a relationship that forms. We said think family, and the covenant relationship takes priority over any other relationship. That's another point that we've made. Then some, we started talking about symbols a little bit last week, and we're going to continue with a little bit more of that tonight, the seriousness and the symbols of them. But we talked about how Jesus exchanged our robe of flesh for his robe of righteousness. We talked about that last week, that when we enter into a covenant relationship with him, there's a, and we, we hit on Jonathan and David, and that was something that we saw in their covenant relationship, the exchange of robes, but that, that happens with us as well in our relationship with Jesus. So to see, and when we do that, when we exchange the robes, to see Jesus is to see me. To see me is to see Jesus and vice versa. And another thing is, in, in the same, same breath, when we entered into a covenant relationship with Jesus, our covenant partner gave us his armor. Those are just some other, thing, other symbols of being in a relationship or in a covenant relationship. So that's, that's your quick review. That was just for free. And just so you can, if those of you who weren't here, you know, I want you to kind of have that in your head as we continue on. So tonight we are going to continue with our storyline of Jonathan and David. But before we get, get to that, I just wanted to give you a quote from uh, Dr. H. Clay Trumbull. So, you know, that's his name. Uh, for some reason, that gives me a hard time saying it. And it comes from the Blood Covenant. And this is a resource that Kay Arthur references a lot in her study. And he says, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he says this fact. And this just, I don't know, this just fascinated me. There are blood covenants in cultures all around the world. Like almost every continent, you can find a reference to a, a covenant of some kind, blood covenants. It has its meaning from days of old and meaning today. And as we study the symbols and customs, we find that its source, covenant, the blood covenant, its source is the word of God. Meaning the origin 
is the creator of covenant is God himself. And so even cultures who are not Christian cultures, but they are practicing blood covenants, like they may not even realize it or believe it, but they are practicing something that was originated, began with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like that's, he's the originator of it. That just fascinated me. That was for free. So tonight we're going to go on and continue with Jonathan and David. And it's going to give us insight, more insight into the gravity or the seriousness of covenant, of entering into a covenant relationship, Um, and then therefore the seriousness and the responsibility that is ours when uh, we are recipients of that new covenant relationship in Christ. So we're kind of look at, you know, biblical stories, you know, I told you we're going to just look at different stories all throughout scripture, but we're also going to, you know, look at our relationship with Jesus as well. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel 20. You have in your homework sheets a copy of that entire chapter, and you will study that this week. I'm going to hit a few highlights of it tonight, but go ahead and you know mark this chapter because we're going to start here. I'm going to go away and chase a rabbit, and then I'm going to come back and, and get back into First Samuel and Second Samuel even. Can you all believe this? I'm going to cover like a lot of, we're not going to read all, but we're going to cover a lot, so I'm going to need you like on, you know, be ready, be ready. So just keep something in First Samuel 20 because we're going to leave it, but then we will come back. So we left off last week with David as a hero. He had just slain Goliath, and he also entered into a blood covenant, a blood brother of, of Jonathan. They became blood brothers. And don't forget, Jonathan is Saul's son, King Saul. And so we talked about how Two became one. Jonathan and David became one. To see Jonathan was to see David, etc. Now, at this, and then David became very, he never went back home. He stayed in Saul's court and he basically got a job with Saul's men and he was, you know, a leader in the army. And he was very successful, extremely successful. And so now Saul is like, Saul is like crazy jealous of David and all of his success. And so, Basically, he wants him dead. He wants David, Jonathan's covenant brother, dead. That's, that's his goal. And so David tells Jonathan his fears. He's like, dude, I think your dad wants me dead. You know, maybe not quite that casual. But he, he tells him his fears. And so they come up with a plan because Jonathan's like, surely not. Surely, you know, my dad knows that we are in cut. Like, surely not that that's not my, the heart of, of, of the king. And so Jonathan agrees that he's going to find out for sure. And so we're going to pick up in uh, chapter, chapter 20, verse 12. And this is them talking. Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day. So give me a couple days. Give me a few days. Behold, if there is a good, if there is a good feeling toward David, shall I not then send to you and make it known? I can't read. <laughs> shall I not send, then send to you and make it known to you? If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also. If I do not make it known to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? This is, that's Jonathan talking to David. You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Okay, we're going to stop there just for a second. So what just happened is, like, Jonathan's kind of like, no, no way. But if, just in case, you know, they're reminding each other of the covenant relationship that they already had, Okay. But then they also agree to enter into it another covenant. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So at verse, there's a verse 23. You're going to read it this week. But David is even reminding Jonathan, and they're reminding each other, like, we've already made an agreement. We've already entered into an agreement, and the Lord is between you and me forever. It's a forever thing. So what they decide to do is day, there's a feast. It's a three-day, it's the noon moon, new moon feast. And so they agree what they're going to do is 
test, kind of test the waters. And David is going to skip the feast, okay? And this would not be accepted to do that for, like, to have an empty seat where the king is expecting you. You don't do that. That's kind of disrespectful. And so David's going to skip the feast and just see, Jonathan's going to test Saul's response and see what he does. Well, spoiler alert, Saul gets angry and basically threatens, like, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill David. That seems a little much, but that's basically how it goes down. That's my paraphrased version. You get to see the detailed version this week. So Jonathan now has his answer. And so Jonathan and David, before this, they have come up with a code. They have got this secret code. If my dad's going to do you harm, I'll let you know. And the secret plan is I'm going to go with a servant, and I'm going to like do some archery. And if I shoot the arrow a certain way and I say, the arrows are beyond you, like talking to the servant, then you'll know, David, you're going to be in hiding. And you'll, when you hear me say that, you'll know my dad means you harm. The king means you harm. you got to go. you got to get out of the, king, of, of the kingdom. So that is, that is what happened. He found out, and so they, they went through with their plan. And then we're going to pick up in 41, the very end of, of 1 Samuel 20. When the lad, that's the servant, when the lad was gone, David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed each other, picture cheek to cheek, and wept together. But David wept the more. Jonathan said to David, go in safety, inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he rose and departed while Jonathan went into the city. So this is a big, heavy moment right now. I, I don't know if you fully have grasped, and we talked about it last week and in your reading you know, this week, just the, the depth of their relationship and their their friendship. And this is, this is goodbye. Like, you know, they're, they're having to separate. So this is, this is, this is a sad, tough scene. And so they've said goodbye, but before they did, before they separated, we, we, we saw that Jonathan made a second covenant with David. They, they cut a second covenant because David knew Saul wanted him dead. And so they, you know, he made sure to remind Jonathan of the covenant. Hey, don't forget, we're, we're one now. We're one. I know your dad, the king, wants me dead, but we entered into covenant. And don't forget, you know, that whole two become one and to see me is to see you. You know, you know, and so if I have an enemy, that means that's your enemy too, Jonathan, even if it's the king, even if it's you know, your dad. You know, a covenant relationship supersedes every other one. So, and for us, when I partake of Christ, I enter into a covenant that supersedes all other relationships as well. So, real quick, in verse 14, Jonathan asked David something interesting. And you'll mark it and you'll see it in your... But he says, as long as I live, show loving kindness to me. That word, loving kindness, you can underline it. I'm going to... Or highlight it, mark it somehow you want, however you want to. But that is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it means, you know, loving kindness, it's to show mercy. It is so often connected or seen with covenant. Whenever you're talking covenant, hesed is somewhere around. So it, most scholars consider hesed or that loving kindness word to be a covenant term because they are so often together. And so Jonathan asked David, as long as I live, show me loving kindness. And then he goes on a step further and he says, actually, as long, show my house, show my generations to come after me, even, even after you have no more enemies, David, because let me, let me tell you this, Jonathan, I think, knew, you know, David's going to be the next king. God's already anointed him. So even when you don't have any enemies, even when Saul's not after you anymore or whatever, like, don't forget this new covenant. You're going to show my family and me loving kindness forever. And so in verse 13 and verse 16, uh, I'm kind of going back and forth a little bit. I'm not going in order on purpose, but just, just stay with me. I know y'all are tracking with me. In verse 13 and verse 16, we have some similar language that I just want you to notice and mark or in however way you want to. But we have phrases that say something like, May the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also. That was verse 13. And verse 16 says something like, May the Lord require it. And basically, what they are saying, what, what they're saying to each other is, God has witnessed this covenant that they've made. And they expected God to give consequences if they didn't keep it. 
God witnessed the covenant that they just entered into before and, and now, the second one. And now we expect God, to, if we don't keep our word, if we don't go, follow through with this, we, we are calling on the name of God to, he's going to give us the consequences, okay? It's, uh, he is watching between you and me in this covenant. That's what Jonathan and David are saying to each other. There is a word for this. This concept of the Lord watching between you and me. And it's another Hebrew word. You're going to love it. I like to say it. I don't know why. It just makes me happy. Mizpah. Mizpah. M-I-Z-P-A-H. Mizpah. And it literally means the Lord watch between me and you. That's what it means. Now, we're going to pause here because I want to show you a story um, in the Bible that really explains Mizpah quite clearly because it's um, where, where we have it, I think, first, where we see the example of this. And it's all the way back in Genesis 31, if you want to go there with me or just write it down and reference it later. Genesis 31, 43 through 55 is kind of where we'll be. And I just want to show you this story in Scripture of Mizpah and what it really means in detail. So it's the story of Jacob, which is Abraham, you know, our big guy, Abraham, Genesis 15. It's Abraham's grandson. So Jacob is grown now, and it's the story of Jacob and his father-in-law, Laban, okay? Now, Laban is a sneaky little, sneaky little dude. He's slippery, okay? And Jacob hadn't been innocent his entire life either, but, you know, just so you know, so we've got two guys that are just, you know, they've they got some issues. They've got issues, but God's still going to use them. So Laban was sneaky and had tricked Jacob, at this point in his life, had tricked Jacob into marriage. He had married two of his daughters, one he wanted to, but the first one was a, kind of a trick. And he also kind of tricked him into, into work, you know, working for the wives and, and, and just, and he, and he was just dishonest, like would take his wages and to, he just wasn't, wasn't very good to Jacob. So after 20 years, Jacob is chooses to leave. And so he is leaving, has left with his wives, his children and belongings, etc. And Laban ain't happy. He's just lost like his workhorse, you know, and, and his grandchildren and his daughters. And so all kinds of drama have unfolded before we get to where we're going to read tonight. And he even chases Jacob. He's going to go get him. He's going to get back his belongings, his belongings and his, and his daughters and all that. He is ticked. And one night while you know, he's on the chase, God even like speaks to Laban and says, don't mess with him. Leave him alone. Even if you get with him, you know, get, catch up with him, don't, don't mess with him. Leave him alone. And so now Laban knows, you know, I can't, I can't really touch him. So they finally connect, and Jacob pleads his case. He's like, look, I've, I've worked for you all these years, but I, I, I'm going to go. It's time to go. And Laban eventually concedes. That's the, the quick quick version, and he offers a covenant. He says, all right, well, let's enter into a covenant then, okay? So you, you know that that's a big deal if, when they start throwing around the word covenant. Verse 48, Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, am I on the right one? Yeah, no, wait, I want to go to 43. Sorry, y'all, I had it circled. Forgive me, I knew that it wasn't making sense. And verse 43, and Laban replied to Jacob, the daughter the daughters are my daughters, and the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these daughters or to, these, or to their children whom they have born? So now, come, let us make a covenant. Let us cut a covenant, you and I, and let it be witness between you and me. Then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And so they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Now Laban called it, oh, Lord have mercy, Jagar Shahalhadutha, whatever. Becca, you get on that one. Let me know how to say that later. Um, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it was named Galid. Verse 49, and Mizpah, for he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. Okay? How far do I want to go? We're going to keep going. If you mistreat my daughters or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap and behold the pillar which I have set before you and me. 
This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, and I will not pass by this heap to you for harm, and you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. So we're going we're gonna to keep it peace. This pillar is kind of our reminder. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of their father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal, and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. And then early the next in the in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and his daughters, and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. Okay, so what just happened there? Let me see where I where I am. May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. Verse 49. That is Mizpah. So basically, again, God sees our covenant today, and he will hold us to it even when we're apart. Even when I'm not with you, Laban, or even when you're not with me, I'm not with you, Jacob, God is going to hold us to this covenant. He has been, this is Mizpah. He is witness to this. And so this story, this covenant was entered in based on the marriage of Jacob and his daughter. So this, this says a lot to do with family and marriage. And I just want to take a brief moment to just show you some covenant symbols that we saw in here. I don't know if you, if you picked up on them or not, but we're going to look at them. The covenant symbols that are involved um, here, but also that are involved today, you have examples of in wedding ceremonies because I think they're pretty cool. And some of you, this is like before you get married, I am so glad to tell you this. I wish I had heard some of these things. And for those of you who are married, like it's just cool and you know, just to realize what was happening and maybe reframe even your wedding day for you. Um, like I said, it's just cool. So because the point is you're not planning just a wedding ceremony, you know, ceremony with traditions. You are entering into a covenant with a man when you get married and you're painting a picture of of a relationship, of what a covenant relationship looks like. So in verse 45, he mentions uh, stacking stones or setting up a pillar even. Um, and those are markers, a marker of making a covenant. And that's a, that's a tradition when, when this culture, the Jewish culture, would enter into a covenant, they would make a marker of some kind. We do the same thing in weddings. And, and, and it's a wedding ring. When you exchange rings, it's a marker. Because when, in this case, when Laban or Jacob, whenever they passed that, that pillar, that heap of stone, it was a reminder, I am in a, in a covenant relationship. And I'm not going to forget that covenant. Even when I'm not with them, I remember that I'm in that relationship. And that's what a, what a, what a band does, what a ring does as well or supposed to do. In verse 53, they make an oath. Jacob, uh, it talks about um, they swore an oath. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father. They entered into with a, with a swearing, with a solemn oath. And we do that in wedding ceremonies. They, they take vows and um, at, at their wedding. With covenant, those are covenant terms, taking oaths, um, setting up stones. These are all covenant terms. And I want you to relate these symbols to covenant relationships. There's also, they had a meal together. That's another covenant symbol. When you um, sit down with the covenant partner and eat a meal together. Um, and we do that in weddings. There's wedding receptions. There's food. Or at the very least, there's cake. You know, there is a, there is a covenant meal. So those are just some, some simple ones. But one of the, the, the essential requirement, I think you know this by now, but the essential requirement to entering into a covenant relationship is bloodshed. Covenant is bloody. And in 54, we, verse 54, we see that there is a, 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 a sacrifice. So an animal had to die on an altar. So there was bloodshed on the altar. And we saw that that was an essential requirement all the way back in Genesis 15 where covenant was defined when Abram sacrificed the animals and walked the blood path walk that aisle. And so there's a couple of things I want to say about aisle. I mean, literally, you walk down an aisle, which is a, a terrific symbol of entering into a covenant. And some ceremonies, I know we did in ours, the groom walks first, symbolizing entering into a covenant. And then the bride walks into a covenant. You realize you're, it's the, the two parties are agreeing. Do you remember what we talked about? May I, if I don't keep this. May you do this to me. Do you see the aisle? The aisle? And just, this is another for freebie. For freebie? Yeah, that's right. Freebie. Because um, I love this too. Things die on altars. And in this case, the bride and the groom are called to die to themselves. 
And that's what, you, that's, what you, that's what we put on the altar in a wedding. You die to self. But now, I want to warn you, I'm about to get graphic. And I think you can handle it. But I'm about to get just real honest. So get your junior high self together <laughs> and get the giggles out now because we're going to get graphic, okay? But I need you to stay with me because this is an amazing picture that I want to, I want to paint for you. The bridal suite, your wedding night, is where the actual covenant is cut. The physical union between a husband and a wife is the cutting of covenant through the shedding of the wife's blood with the breaking of her hymen, right? I just used a scientific term, but that literally happens. Now, some cultures would even, after the wedding night, like take out, bring out the bed sheet to show the blood, to, sim- to show and to celebrate, you know, like for proof and to celebrate that the covenant had been, indeed, had been made, had been cut. So, and I realize in this day and age, there have been invents- of advancements with feminine products. And so sometimes that whole situation gets broken before the wedding night. So I realize that may not be, I, I told you I'm being graphic, but I want to get this clear with y'all, okay? <laughs> Um, I realize it may not hap- happen on your wedding night just like that as far as blood, you know, happening. But what is the definition of covenant? Does anybody remember that Hebrew term, covenant? You can even look back on page one of your notes. Does anybody remember? A solemn, binding agreement made by what? I just want to hear somebody say it. I know it, but I want to hear y'all say it. Made by what? Passing through pieces of flesh, a solemn binding agreement made by passing through pieces of flesh. And just like Abram walked the Isle of Blood. Okay, here's the graphic picture. If, you, if it hasn't already been, as if it hasn't been graphic enough. <laughs> but the wife's legs form an aisle for her husband to pass through to cut a covenant. That's right. I went there. But it's true. <laughs> it's true. And I wish I had heard this early on. And so you're hearing it from me now. I will just be the one to tell you. I don't care if I'm embarrassed and my face is red right now. Like, I wish (laughs) I had been told that, okay, way before. And so it raises the bar quite a bit, doesn't it, of of what sex really is. Because Hollywood ain't got a clue. The world ain't got a clue. We've made it so common and we're numb. It's numbed us to its holy meaning, Sex is a form of cutting a covenant, and God created it. It's good. It's fun. But I want us to see how serious it is. So, and I feel the need to stop here um, because if you mourn this fact, if this is something that you're like, don't you dare let the enemy steal this moment of revelation from you right now with, like, guilt and shame. Mm-mm. No way. Because it's never too late. This side of heaven, it's never too late to ask for forgiveness. Like, don't you dare doubt how loved you are, how you are in a covenant relationship. You are so very much loved. And now that you have a deeper understanding of all that it means, sex and and covenant, all that it means, instead of just saying, no, not until we get married because my preacher says so, like, it's so much bigger than that. It paints such a, a bigger picture. And so... Don't, just, don't ever doubt how dearly loved you are, and, but also own it. Ask for, for his forgiveness. You are his beloved. Ask for forgiveness. And in light of covenant, like live in light of covenant from this point on. Okay? Okay. So, <laughs> did I chase a rabbit or what? Mizpah means the Lord watches. Did y'all even forget we were talking about Jonathan and David? I did. But let's get back, Okay. I mean, okay, all right, all right. Okay, Mizpah means that the Lord watches between you and me and our covenant, even when we're apart. Even if I'm not, you know, living day in and day out with you, even if I've entered into a covenant, even when I'm not with you, it holds. It, It and the Lord is witness to it. Okay, and in 1 Samuel 20, that's what we saw with Jonathan and David. God requires a covenant to be kept. Because he takes covenant very seriously, and he's witness to them. And so we just need to remember that. And so in 1 Samuel 20, once they made that second covenant, Jonathan knew my descendants are going to be okay. My family's going to be okay because there is Mizpah between, between David and I. 
God is witness to it, and he's not going to forget, and it is a forever covenant. My, and descendants and family and the heritage is a big deal. And so Jonathan knows that I'm set. And so real quick, I want to give you a fast forward because we got to get to somewhere else. I just want to tell you what happens to the rest of 1 Samuel because it's quite exciting. Saul begins a crazy pursuit of David. He wants to kill him. He wants, him, he, he wants to get him dead. And it's just something to behold if you read through that David's um, fear of God and respect for the king, for Saul. It was amazing. It truly is something to behold and just to see that balance, how he won't touch God's man, the king. Um, and he lets you know, God deal with that. But finally, the chase for David end, ended when Saul and his sons were killed by the Philistines. Do you remember their enemy? That was in 1 Samuel 31. As a matter of fact, they were beheaded, and their bodies were hung on the walls of Beth Shan, which is a Philistine town. It was very, it was, it was awful. And so 2 Samuel begins, we're now in 2 Samuel, it begins with David's lament. He's brokenhearted because his covenant partner, Jonathan, no longer lived. And this was devastating. He no longer lived, but their covenant was forever. He will not forget his covenant. Remember, Jonathan said, You shall not cut off loving kindness, Hesed, from my house forever. Now, one, of son, one son of Saul still lived, and so there was an obvious battle for the throne right there. Even, even though God had already anointed David to, to be the next king, there was still, you know, man, man, we make our own plans sometimes. And so there was a battle for the throne, and I won't even go into all that, but there was. And uh, eventually, though, that son was murdered, that Saul's only living son was murdered. And um, as a matter of fact, this is interesting to me, that David had the, those murderers, even though they were after David. Saul had been after David, but then when Saul's son was murdered, David had those murderers put to death. I find that so interesting, but don't forget, you know, because they were in a covenant relationship. And, you know, he, remember, when he entered into that covenant with Jonathan, Jonathan's enemies and his family's enemies became David's enemies. Isn't that beautiful? Like, we're talking about death and murder, but like, he keeps his covenant. He remembers his enemies became my enemies. And so then in 2 Samuel 5, David is anointed king over all of Israel. By 2 Samuel 8, David has defeated the Philistines and subdues all the nations around them, and there are no more enemies. And we're good. Okay, scene. We're good. So, now we're going to pick up in 2 Samuel 9, okay? Time has gone by, and hold on, let me get there myself, just so, because I'm going to read a little bit to you, but that, that's what happened all through those chapters, okay? And so remember, David and Jonathan entered into a second covenant, and Jonathan said, remember my family. Don't cut off loving kindness from all generations. So we pick up in 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 6. Then David said... Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness, Hesed, for Jonathan's sake? He's rem After all that's happened, David's sitting there in a quiet castle because all the enemies are subdued. He's like, I made a covenant. Is there anybody? Is there anybody left that I can keep a, my, for Jonathan's sake that I can show kindness to? Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Zippah. Don't y'all love these names? Just wait. I'm about to give y'all some names. Lord have mercy. Was, and the servant's name was Zippah. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Zippah? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, is there not yet anyone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Zippah said to him, said, said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, how far do I want to go? Let me see. I'm going to read till six. So the king said to him, where is he? And Zippah said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir to the son of, the son of, <laughs> y'all help me, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, that's his name. Can y'all believe that? What a name. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. So you have that picture? Okay. So Ziba tells David, there's still a son left. Jonathan has one son, and he's still alive. His name's Mephibosheth, and that's unfortunate, but he's still alive, okay? That is so hard to say. I literally, in my notes, I just kept saying Miff, 
because it's just so hard. Meph, meph, mephib. Anyway, okay. So when Saul and Dave, when Saul and Jonathan were killed, and you can get this story if you're just interested. It's all the way back in 2 Samuel 4. But when Saul and Jonathan were killed, Jonathan had a nurse in his house, and the nurse that was taking care of Mephibosheth, right, fled the house, fled with him. And it makes you wonder if she fled in fear, did she know of the covenant between that covenant relationship between Jonathan and David? Because this, this war, this battle was between David and the, ho- the house of David, the house of Saul. And, and so then she fled to hide, to go into hiding. And, and it just makes you wonder if she knew of the covenant. What did she have to fear, you know, um, as far as from David? Because she was, you know, anyway. Um, and that's just a great question to ask ourselves sometimes it's just kind of a little sidebar like but or to realize when we're running in fear of God over things um, it's just pretty clear that we don't understand our covenant relationship either she apparently doesn't have a clear understanding of the covenant relationship that she's under or that Mephibosheth's under and and she's running in fear and so second Samuel 4 tells us and like I said, you can go back and read that on your own, um, that he fell and he became lame and crippled in his feet. And then he went into hiding or lived in hiding in the place called Lodabar, Lo-Debar. And it literally means place of no fruit. That's what Lodabar means. It just sounds so barren, right? It's like a barren land, a place of no fruit. So David calls for Mephibosheth, but Mephibosheth clearly didn't know about the covenant either. Or his life could have been so different sooner, so much sooner. And so you, we have that picture. We saw that Mephibosheth comes in and he fearfully falls before David because he didn't know about or at least understand their relationship. And I said this the first night, and I want to read it again, but when we don't know about covenant or when we don't understand it, there's an element missing from our lives. We miss the security, the intimacy, the peace the assurance that comes from being in covenant with God. When you're not aware of the covenant relationship that you have available to you, something's missing. And simply put, when, you're, when you don't know about the covenant and your covenant relationship with God and what all that means, you don't have any idea how dearly loved you are. Something's missing, and I want us to know that. Let's pick up in verse 7 and 13 and see what happens with our, with our, with our guys here. David said to him, He's looking at Mephibosheth. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness, hesed, covenant term, kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself. How far do I want to go? I want to go to 13. All right. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You, it's talking about Mephibosheth, you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, Mephibosheth. You shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and they all were going to work the land for Mephibosheth now. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, see how it happens. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. You know, I don't know why they end with that, other than some studies and some you know historians will show like if you were lame or crippled, it was kind of like they did you didn't they wanted you to stay out of the city, like not around the king. Like, it's not, like, they just didn't want that to be seen, as a weakness to be associated with the king. And so don't miss that. that he's like, you come in, you sit at my table. We are, you are so very associated with me. We are in covenant relationship. Um, so I think that, that's, that's, to me, that's why that, that ends right there. It's kind of a strange ending. So David owned all of Saul's lands. 
he is the king now. That was his lands, his wives, his concubines, every, concubines, everything that was Saul's is now David's because he was the king now. But there was a covenant relationship that supersedes that. And so he invites Mephibosheth to dine at his table because David remembers two have become one. And he looks at Mephibosheth and says, Whenever you, whatever need you have, I promise to provide it. I promise. And this is such a great picture, but like almost instantly Mephibosheth became a rich man. And not because he earned it, but because of covenant. Like I just got chills because like the same is true for us. Like when you enter into a covenant relationship, instantly you become very rich. All right? You become, you become rich in Christ. And maybe we can relate to Mephibosheth a little bit. Maybe you have, or maybe you are now, you've uh, kind of hidden out in a place or a season of no fruit, no growth. Maybe you've been lame in your own sin. Or maybe you didn't understand, or you just didn't know God's covenant love for you. Didn't understand it. But uh, that's what this whole study has been about, is to... But, but covenant with God is everlasting, and he wants to bless and use us still. And so maybe you didn't realize that you had an invitation to come to his table and feast at Christ's table as a child of the king. And maybe you didn't realize how welcome you are, because like I said, how rich you are in Christ. As I think for me, at least, sometimes I believe the lie that or it can creep up, and I realize I'm struggling with a lie at least. Um, we believe the lie that that offer is for everybody else but me. You know, that that's true for everybody else. I can see that truth. I can believe that for everybody else but me. And I just want to read, again, if you pick up a theme, I've read this or alluded to this every week. Matthew 26, where Jesus is at his table. And I, want you to, I just want to remind you again of what he says as we sit at his table. This is the, the Last Supper when he's with his disciples. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I just want to remind you... In covenant, your sins are forgiven, and not because of anything that you do to earn that, but because of God's covenant love. We are a lot like Mephibosheth. And God's covenant love is a never-stopping, all-in, all-encompassing, all-forgiving, everlasting covenant love that was cut for, for you and for me on the cross. Because a restored relationship with his crown of creation, humanity, you, it was worth it to God to enter into a covenant. And so, yes, I would say, as he sent his son to the cross, that, yes, covenant, God takes it very seriously. And he's a witness to it when we enter in, into it with him and with others. And so I just I want to challenge us this week to take it very seriously as well and to begin to understand that. Let me pray for us before we break out in small groups. God, I love you so much. And every time I read the story of Jonathan and David and Mephibosheth, it just grips me. Because I've done nothing to earn your love. I can't ever do enough. But I'm just so thankful that you give it freely. Because of covenant. And I pray that each of us in our own way, whatever is laming us, whatever is keeping us back from fully understanding that or fully living under the privilege and in the privilege of covenant relationship, I pray that we would just let that go. We would deal with that or begin to uproot that. And uh, I just pray that, um, that after tonight we just see how serious you take it and that it changes us and makes us take it seriously as well. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.